Okay, yeah, so um, welcome. Uh, it's fantastic to see so many people here. Uh, just in case you don't know me, my name's Kim Knowles. I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Theatre, Film and Television Studies. Um, and I'm also a co-director with Miranda Wall of this new Centre for Material Thinking. So the idea for, um, for the event today was for me to, to sort of get my head around what this idea of material thinking is and to, to share that with people in the department, but also um, outside the department within Aberystwyth University, people that might want to um, contribute to the centre, but also people outside the university um, that might end up collaborating in some way because it is uh, conceived to be an experimental site of, of collaboration, of creative and critical thinking around this concept of you know, materiality and, and what materiality means in different, um, in different disciplines and in different, from different methodological approaches. Um, so we launched the centre in November. I'm just going to say briefly um, a little bit about the, the, the idea behind it. Um, so we launched it in November uh, with a talk by Professor Carrie Noland, who talked about dance and, um, and gesture. Um, we, are, we always thought about this as being an interdisciplinary research centre that touched on this idea of material thinking from a broad range of perspectives. So starting with um, a, a talk on dance seemed um, quite appropriate. It's, it aims to bring together different research interests in the theatre, film and television studies department, but also other departments across the university, particularly um, the School of Art where Miranda is located. So the idea is that it brings lots of different strands of thinking around materiality. And Miranda and I were just having a, a discussion this afternoon about you know, the fact that this centre could actually be called the centre for thinking about everything because everything is bound up in some way in um, this question of, of materiality. So we're trying to explore materiality in all its manifestations using this term as a way to transcend disciplinary um, boundaries. And to think about the role that materials, objects, things, stuff, matter, whatever you want to call it, human, non-human, animate and inanimate, come to bear on our attitudes and behaviours. And importantly, how the fragile ecology of things and the way that we think about things has an impact on the future of the planet. So this is not to approach materiality or materials as self-evident, um, or to think about things as pre-constituted, fixed, or even inherently knowable. Um, from my own perspective, thinking about this, I'm much more interested in the insights that emerge from Bruno Latour's actor network theory, which places emphasis on the relationship between people and things, um, as well as the various practices and environmental factors um, at play in these interactions. But also Karen Barad's influential thinking about matter derived from um, quantum field theory. Um, Karen Barad takes what she calls an agential realist approach. She says ontology is not a matter of givenness. She says entities, space and time exist only within and through their specific intra actions. This is not to say that they are mere transient and fleeting effects, but rather that they are specifically materially constituted. So seeing material in this way problematizes traditional hierarchical relationships between things when man sits at the top in terms of evolutionary progress and all other creatures and non-sentient beings, things cascade downwards. So in all disciplines, we're seeing the effects of this non-anthropocentric view of the world and a multiplicity of emerging um, Sorry, we're seeing the effects of this non-anthropocentric view of the world in a multiplicity of emerging research centres, research projects, art science collaborations that are trying to harness this thinking to elicit new ways of, um, of being in the world, new ways of relating to the world and to each other. 
Uh, she unfortunately can't make it uh, this evening, but Milia Kuki's um, work on planetary politics has been a, a, a big inspiration for me recently. Um, this is based on the, the relational nature of the universe. And I never thought that as a film scholar specializing in experimental cinema and more specifically cultures of 16 millimeter filmmaking, that I'd find myself immersed in and really fascinated by theories of international relations. Nor did I expect to be devouring literature on the relationship between sea lice and wrasse or cleaner fish in Norwegian salmon farms or the behaviors of ant colonies. But all of this research centers my thinking on material entanglement and the messy realities of what Jane Bennett calls vibrant matter. And so the Center for Material Thinking aims to be a testing ground for these exciting new approaches to materiality that don't necessarily follow a logical trajectory or don't adhere to disciplinary boundaries. So we're using this event as a starting point. It's an experiment in, in collaborative thinking to bring together different perspectives on the material and what it means to think with and through material. And as Miranda said to me earlier on, we're trying to find identifiable pathways um, into to thinking about material and how um, we can use it to, to bring about new ethical forms of, um, of being in the world. So with that, um, I'm going to hand over to Miranda, who's um, a lecturer in fine art and director of creative arts in the School of Art. And um, she's gonna start uh, our series of, of presentations on what it means to think materially. Thank you so much, Kim. This is so exciting to have so many people join us tonight, way past our expectations. So thank you all so much for coming. So Kim, am I, have you enabled uh, screen share? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So can everyone see that? Is that good? Yeah. Yeah, great. Okay. So my talks are just about six and a half minutes long, okay? And I'm just reading uh, text that I've written and working through images. So I'm going to bring my crawling practice to this discussion on what is material thinking, specifically a crawl I did in an ancient woodland in Ceredigion in August 2019. The components of this 24 hour crawling performance now resides in various modes of representation. A series of social media updates, hundreds of digital photographs by Hannah Mann, hours and hours of raw GoPro footage taken from the 14 GoPro cameras attached to my body, GoPro film stills, an audio recording, an eight minute edited film and a proposal for a multi-screen film installation. The reason for choosing to discuss this project over any of my other crawling performances is because this project is bookended by two antithetical modes of materiality. On the one hand, a physical experience so real, so visceral, vibrant and intense that it has left an indelible mark upon and in my body. And on the other end, a cybernetic organism made from a process of duplication, mirroring and inversion, a creature that continues to stalk the pathways of the digital wilderness. From 4 o'clock p.m. on Saturday the 1st of August to, to 4 o'clock p.m. on Sunday the 2nd of August, I became a human-animal technological hybrid. I temporarily became an it, an other, an alliance, a symbiotic union, a co-creating community, an interconnected future. When I entered the turbulent, imminent field of the forest floor in which various and variable materialities collide, collide, congeal, morph, evolve and disintegrate, 
To quote Michael Serres in his book, The Birth of Physics, I, di I directly explored material entanglement. Crawl 9, 12 o'clock p.m. I am back in the rhythm and familiarity of crawling again. It feels fantastic to be down there on my hands and knees. Doris, the Hungarian badger head, is staying on my back in her glass dome. It hasn't come apart or broken yet. The wood, a hopelessly inadequate, all-encompassing noun, has started to reveal itself. Unpeeling, leaf by leaf, biting bracken, thick waterlogged moss, peeling lichen, ivy, unfurling ferns, leaf litter, hair grass, crackling branches, woody piece by woody piece, woodily presenting itself in sharp focus, all of us enveloped by a lingering wall of warm air. My consciousness is fractured, each GoPro camera strapped to my trunk, limbs, head, hands and mouth are looking for me, catching me, splintered, my body in black lycra plunging and plundering belligerent brave and badger, I am moving out of humanness with every knee step. Three o'clock a.m. crawl 12. I am in, I am becoming wood, I am becoming badger, and I am sick. All of God's slimy, multiple-legged, eight-headed, winged, bulging-eyed creatures are crawling between my bare fingers. It is abject, wretched, but exhilarating. Crawl 17, 8 a.m. Five layers of foam in the knee pads now. Doris is getting heavier. Our night wood is becoming less opaque. Quickly, bathing in flirtatious, fickle, dappled light, it betrays us. I am already longing for the secrets of the nocturnal wood, the thicker smells, the deeper sounds and the richer tastes but I also want to cry with pain and more than anything, I want to sleep. Crawl 24, three o'clock PM. Time to go underground with the badgers now or time to go home for a bath and an inspection of my scratches and wounds. I choose the latter. But I leave our camp knowing that for a few otherly minutes in the deepest, darkest wood last night, I think I possibly, slightly, almost crawled out of being human and into becoming something else. Now, roaming in the digital wood, we are cyborg, we are feral. Hauled through day, then night, then day again, glimpsed by the red flickering camera's lights. We are a mass of disembodied limbs, a distorted head, a sucking insect, lost and found in a digital forever, appearing and disappearing as the timeline carries us, makes us and swallows us. Simon Whitehead, who's with us tonight, wrote in his essay, Crawling Not Walking for Cross Path Sheep 2018, perhaps Miranda, through her crawls, is also physically modelling something for us, an invitation to enmesh, to heft again, to bring our bodies to the ground, to each other, to animal. The animal agent teaches us how to belong, to be in, on and around, to bodily know and practice our place again amongst the weave of things. To loosely quote Jane Bennett from her book Vibrant Matter, 
I believe it is necessary to cut off the human upper hand and change our earth-destroying fantasies of conquest and consumption. In my own words, it is time to get down and get materially entangled in what matters, the matter, again. Fantastic. Thank you, Miranda. Um, we will move swiftly on and um, if you have questions, then uh, you can either put them in the chat or save them up for the discussion at the end. Um, so we'll move on to um, Margaret Ames, who is a senior lecturer in the Department of Theatre, Film and Television Studies. Um, and Mags, I'll just hand over to you. We don't have, am I right, that we don't have images? Yes, um, apologies everybody. I've had more computer meltdowns today and uh, I can't share my screen. And now my computer has swallowed up my presentation anyway. There were to be four uh, images taken from performance, which might have helped uh, illustrate what I'm about to talk about. Um, so I'm just going to read. Uh, and I'll just do that now then. <laughs> so um, uh, I'm, in my work, I'm trying to think about the presence of bodies of people in relation to one another and in action through dance and theater. And I think this practice-based work responds to the question that you asked Kim, how do we make meaning from matter and how do material entanglements determine the way we inhabit the world? I'm trying to work on the materiality of dance and entangling of bodies, space and time. I do this through the lens of disability and in particular learning disability or as is becoming fashionable now, intellectual disability. And again, I find entanglements within various frames that compete and interconnect such as ethics, hierarchies of need, intentions and aesthetics. Right now, my focus is changing and I'm not sure where I'm going with this shift in my awareness of what happens in the practice with my participants in the studio and what happens in a performance for, or for an audience. There is always multiplicity. I feel as if I and we are always managing many competing elements of action, affect and concrete practicalities that are not separate experiences. They are one and many and always in play. Perhaps this leads me to the imprecise idea or suggestion of affect as materiality. Affect is produced and produces action and has consequences. The unexpected and intentional appearance of gesture suggests that gesture is thought made material. Agamben tells us that the mediality of gesture and of dance offers being in language, untied from any specific meaning, and it's exactly what it is, what appears, the materiality of the gesture, the body in action. He says, quote, it allows the emergence of the being in a medium of human beings, and thus it opens the ethical dimension for them. End quote. Yet gesture is tied to language. When words and concepts lie out of reach, how articulate can the moving body become? Key to this work is something about the ethical dimension of non-disabled people taking up the gestural utterances of disabled people as deeply serious choreographic articulations of thought. Materiality for me then is the interplay of gesturing bodies, reading, enacting, decoding, and relaying the thought of gesture in the process of becoming something like, perhaps, Bray Dotty's assemblage. In our department, where my research group, Kirfus, with Come to Work, the building thwarts us, stairs and narrow corridors and doors. The lift so often does not work, and in any case, it's shut off after 5 p.m. Ramps get covered by unruly plants outside that tangle in wheels, and the sliding door, uh, and therefore access is usually out of order. I could go on. 
The context and work around my research is this squidgy mess of broken things, social services, families, carers, independent living support workers, personal assistants, on the clock bedtimes. I could go on. I say my thinking is changing and perhaps I'm actually wrong for allowing this and just need to focus better given the array of material injustices that are the material realities of despair and the malignancy of poverty and neglect, I could go on. I wonder, might this research offer a reframing of disability, of non-disabled, non-virtuosic dance, of temporarily abled dancers? Could dance theatre be a way of realising in material form Haraway's tentacular and Bredotti's assemblage? As Bredotti states, an assemblage is non-hierarchical, but disability activists of all kinds know that hierarchies are ever-present and defeat their material lived lives at every turn. And so we should centre disability at the heart of every action, hear the ablest discursive siren call for what it is, a literal and metaphoric death trap, and centre the material facts of radical difference in every example of thought and action, from transport to how and what we teach and what we do every day, travel, buying food, making food, building buildings, filmmaking, fishing, fracking, embroidery, and on and on. Material experience enables material thinking to engage with the facts of the dis, without first pushing and shoving and insisting on a center and an imperative Difference cannot dissolve into rhizomatic flight towards assemblages that eventually undo and disband the central core from which they necessarily emerged. Morton's mesh might be realised in this scenario, but for now at least we deal with the reality of stoma bags and involuntary muscle spasm. We deal with time suspended as we search for comprehension and understanding. We work with constant interruption, bodies that are sedimented blocks of incapacity and the distress of knowing that you do not know, but cannot understand why, and yet you know you are so different that you cannot get to your dance group without months of other people trying to organise a way for you to travel 16 miles across country. You know you don't know, and you know you are not expected or even supposed to know why, but you know all of this anyway. This is materiality with some of its affects. And a final word now on what is interesting me in the centre of these material experiences of theatre and dance practice with disabled people and non-disabled people. The new term diversibility is one to play with, but I'm not convinced when the material facts of the dis are so powerful. The centre is still in the hands of finance and ableism. I, in my non-disabled privileged role as researcher, am still at the centre in this discourse. If I am to convince anyone else, especially my disabled artist, activist, academic colleagues around the world, it might be through the gesture of dance, the gesture of a body in motion that breaks the rules of smooth, able-bodied mobilities. Gesture as abstraction and is tied to meaning. Meaning is fraught and slippery, especially for those who need concrete signs that tell them where to go and what they will find when they get there. But then I think of all the undergrads who ask me, yes, but what does it mean? And, I, and, and, and then I realise their disappointment when I say they must work it out for themselves and that there are always multiple meanings, readings and feelings produced by an artwork. The literal and metaphoric gesture, the gesture of just turning up, of making something, of appearing before others in dance theatre performance makes possible the appearance of the invisible thought made material. I don't know if that was five minutes. Super, Mags. Thank, thank you so much a lot to, um, to think about. Um, Lisa, we move on um, to you. So Lisa McCarty is a, an artist and soon to be a lecturer in photography in the School of Art at Aberystwyth University. Well, can you see my slideshow? Yeah. 
Great, thank you. Um, so I might just go slightly over five minutes and I'm, I'm gonna provide an overview of um, a couple different recent projects. Um, but just to start with the portion of Kim's prompt that I responded to, um, I, I was most interested in these questions. How do you work with materials and the concept of materiality in your research slash creative practice? What does it mean to think with and through the material world? How do you how do, you do your material thinking? Um, so my response to that is that in, in, my, in my work, making images, whether still or moving, I have three main methods of material thinking. First, experimentation with the mechanics of image making and light itself. Second, experimentation with disused and regenerative materials to make images. And third, researching environmentally conscious communities and embodied engagement with specific environments. So just to, just to begin, um, I, I kind of just wanna spend a minute or two um, talking about how I kind of arrived at this methodology and then I'll go quite quickly through um, some projects that exemplify um, these methods. So uh, first when, when um, in my approach as a photographer, um, I've always been fascinated uh, with how images are made. I've never really just been satisfied with kind of taking the camera as it is. Um, I've been fascinated how, with how, um, uh, not only how cameras work, but how human vision works and that we can only see a small slice of the visible spectrum to begin with. So if we look at, if, if we look at the, the range of light waves that are available in the universe, humans see just a small sliver of that, and then cameras in some way replicate what we're able to see, or at least that's what we're told. Um, so I'm kind of fascinated with that project or that, that pro those processes, but also how um, cameras particularly um, have so much mechanical <laughs> um, systems behind the scenes that actually filter light in different ways to create images that come as close to human vision as possible, or at least that that's one of the dominant histories of photography. So um, in, in a, uh, this is the earliest project I'm going to show from roughly 10 years ago. Um, th this is probably the first project where I really tried to, to take on some of these ideas. Um, and I, I, it first started just with an exploration of taking photographs of the same scene with different cameras. Um, and, and this was actually, this, this series started while I was a student and, and that's relevant here for a couple of reasons. Um, first, that I was, I was in a particular program um, with both documentary photographers and experimental filmmakers. And I found, I kind of identified somewhere in the middle and um, the documentary photographers were quite gear obsessed. And there was quite kind of a obsession around four by five field cameras um, um, as, as a tool to get kind of the, the clearest image the most information possible. And so kind of at the same time I was learning that technology, um, I also decided I wanted to learn how to build my own cameras and then kind of compare the results. Um, so these are views of my bedroom window roughly 10 years ago. Uh, the image on the left is made with a manufactured field camera. The image on the right is made with a camera that I created by hand. Um, and, and these are the, the, the two cameras themselves, the manufactured field camera on the left and my handmade view cameras on the right. And uh, I also just wanna mention that the, the, the cameras I made um, were, you, were made out of uh, photo supply boxes and ephemera from uh, the university photo facilities and even boxes that I would save from shipping. I would buy film, save the box, create a camera out of it. Um, and so this, this kind of comes out of a couple different strains of things. My, my position at the time as a student kind of reacting to things around me. Also, I was doing a lot of research about uh, the beginnings of photography and how in the 19th century, it was very common for photographers uh, to make cameras themselves, to make the paper uh, you know, that they used in the cameras that, that photographers were, were making their materials, the cameras at every step of the process. And a lot of that work was done at home in a domestic setting. 
Um, so that, that led me to this investigation to, to kind of carry on and insert myself in this largely male dominated lineage of camera makers um, and kind of origins of photography, trying in, in perhaps maybe at the time, a little bit of a heavy handed way of in, inserting myself a 21st century woman in, into that lineage. And, and what else could I discover with cameras that I made at home? Um, and so I start with this for a couple reasons that um, the, this, this series and kind of clarifying my intentions, what I was interested in, led me to um, the methodology that I've used in a lot of work since. But I, I also want to say that it wasn't um, intentionally crafted at the time. I can only say this now in, in hindsight, but through curiosity, um, institutional critique in a way, and uh, some practical concerns like lack of money as a student, um, I created a methodology that I'm now developing rather intentionally um, to, to use materials that would otherwise be disused or recycled um, or, or not recycled um, and, and to, to really kind of take on a DIY methodology. Um, this carried through in one of my next projects called Photo Sites, um, in which I became um, kind of obsessed with um, how digital cameras were made um, and uh, seeking out uh, trying to teach myself how digital image sensors work and then also taking them apart. Uh, so this involved buying image sensors on eBay and then using a consumer grade digital microscope to literally, I wanted to take it apart, these image sensors that, that filter light and are the only light sensitive element in digital cameras to look at them closely and, and make images at the site of this digital image creation. Um, so purchasing these um, uh, scraps of image sensors um, and then photographing them with a consumer grade digital microscope. Um, and here are a couple images from that series. Oops, sorry. Um, and this series, um, I have both still and moving images as a result of this series. This is an image of an installation of the 12 channel video installation of this work. I'll just carry on um, to another series that, that thinks about, um, that's trying to take on a bit how um, uh, digital file size and um, the creation of video works, um, purposely limiting the file size as a means to kind of be more conscious of um, our, our carbon footprint that we're creating through streaming media. Um, so this is an image, or this is a stills from a video that I made called Flutter. Um, I don't know if it will work here. Maybe not the best image. Oh, I think I hear someone else talking, if you wouldn't mind just muting your mic. Um, but these are stills of an intentionally small sized video. So like when projected or just even on your computer screen, the image is quite small. Again, this is made with a consumer grade microscope and purposely dr dropping frames um, to, to um, create a file size under five megabytes. Um, another approach to this work is um, creating uh, found footage films. Um, and I've been creating found footage films for the past um, five years with images specifically from NASA's publicly available image and sound archives. Um, my most recent film from this series is called Seeing Spacecraft Earth. And I'm using specifically images and sounds that were made by the crew of the um, Apollo 8 mission, um, including that seminal Earthrise image on the left by um, astronaut William, uh, William Anders. Um, but there's a ton of unpublished images um, from that mission, and including this one on the right that I'm using in this piece. Um, so those are a few approaches to, to um, using um, found footage through using, uh, making intentionally small images and recycling camera parts as one part of this methodology. And I'll just quickly say a few things about my other work where I'm intentionally going out um, into particular environments um, related to the kind of the history of environmental consciousness, spending time there, walking on foot with a camera um, and, and also doing research to kind of inspire those, those walks and inform those walks. Um, one of these projects uh, is called Transcendental Concord, 
And um, through this project, I spent a lot of time in Concord, Massachusetts, where the transcendentalist, uh, American transcendentalist writers lived and worked um, in the mid 19th century. So um, uh, material engaging with, with archives, special collections, works by the writers themselves, tracking down uh, where these writers and philosophers lived and worked, retracing their steps and trying to make connections between the past and present with their philosophical ideas and trying to find traces of that in the landscape itself. And then uh, just finally, I'll mention the project that I'm working on now uh, called You and I Are Earth. Um, started last year. And so um, this, in this project, I'm looking at uh, methods of green burial and um, uh, right now in the United States. So um, that, that have been um, revived since the 1990s, but of course methods for green burial or natural burial um, have been prevalent around the world uh, for centuries, but in, um, in the US particularly since the 90s, there's been uh, a resurgence of these methods and in ways in which um, to care for the dead and dying um, that are more regenerative and, um, and environmentally conscious. So actually going to green burial sites and cemeteries, um, photographing you know, quite literally what I see there because there's actually not a lot of documentation of them. Um, but then also this new layer of my practice where in addition to photographing these sites, I'm also collecting plant material from the cemeteries themselves and also making photograms and in, in using um, a plant-based emulsion and through a process called anthotypes. Um, and so that involves much more of, um, kind of again, homemade, homemade emulsions, um, using a food processor, um, much more processes that look quite like cooking um, as opposed to working in um, a traditional darkroom. Um, so that, I know that was quite a lot, um, but that was just a, a quick overview of some recent projects. Uh, thank you, Kim and Miranda. Thank you so much, Nisa. I love that ending with the uh, kind of analogy of, of cooking and, and art making. Uh, it resonates really well, actually, with some of the things that Miranda and I were discussing this afternoon. Um, so thanks. For that, I, we're um, going to move on to Barrett Leisman de Guevara, uh, who is a professor in the um, International Politics Department. So this is um, a really nice opportunity for us to sort of hop into a, a completely different um, discipline. So Barrett, thank you so much. I'll hand over to you. Yeah, thanks a lot. I was trying to share something, but I've had this problem before that my computer somehow doesn't want to do it. Um, so I'll, yeah, sorry, I'm not going to share. It's not going to be many images anyway, and I think I can pull it off without. Um, <laughs> um, and please feel free to stop me because I didn't have a chance to rehearse myself, so I don't know how long I'm going to talk, so please really come in. Um, yeah, thanks so much for having me. I mean, uh, uh, it's really great um, that I can speak here because, uh, yeah, as, as, as Kim said, I'm a professor in international politics and I'm specifically focusing on violent conflicts, international interventions, and kind of also the politics of knowledge around conflict and so on. So that is kind of the, the type of work I'm coming from. Um, so in terms of materials and materiality, I do something which is actually quite unusual in my discipline, which, which is very obsessed with looking at states and kind of big processes and so on. And what I do in my work is I work with textiles and kind of the practice and idea of textile making in my research. And I want to talk a bit through the kind of three steps um, of, of that journey I've been on, because I haven't come from kind of thinking about, oh, how can we think about materiality and IR and then, then let's, let's jump onto textiles, but it's been much more of an organic process. Um, and I want to talk about these three steps of how my thinking around this has developed and is developing. Um, the way I got here, um, uh, I guess, started with an exhibition, a team of people in the department organized with the Art Center in, I think it was 2016, and where we understood textiles as deeply, uh, kind of specifically the kind of conflict textiles we were dealing with as deeply political artifacts. Um, um, and so I don't have a conflict textile as such actually here, but I have something that is in the same style of these textiles with this kind of applique work, uh, quite colorful 
wonderful and so on. I, maybe some of you had the chance to actually be there and see the exhibition at the time. Um, and a lot of the stuff we uh, exhibited was from kind of the uh, Chilean uh, uh, dictatorship times when women actually documented what was going on, not in photos because that was prescribed, but in kind of needlework and kind of also sold these pieces and kind of to get some money for, for kind of for solidarity purposes and to maintain the families of especially uh, families whose, whose breadwinners had been forcibly uh, disappeared. Um, so I had met uh, a woman who co uh, collects these kind of textiles um, previously when I was working in Hamburg. And so we put on this exhibition where we looked at these kind of conflict textiles as object witnesses, which bear difficult knowledge in different registers. Um, namely, first of all, in a documentary register, really as archival records of these human rights violations, uh, but also archival records of, of protests, of women's protests and so on. Um, and then there's the obvious visual register, so kind of depictions of the social events contained in them and how, how kind of these images are composed and so on. So you can do obviously a, a kind of a visual analysis. And I think this is where a, a lot of um, a lot of international relations views on these kind of artifacts often stops that they think it's kind of visual politics only. But then we argued there's also kind of a third kind of register to these pieces, and that's the set sensory, specifically concerning the material quality, because it's textile and quite often, especially those Chilean pieces were made out of used textiles, out of the clothes of the people who had been forcibly disappeared and who they were looking for, for example. So here kind of it kind of, first of all, it's the material that surrounds us in our everyday lives and so on, that's kind of close to our skin, but it's also imbued with all these other meanings. And then these pieces, when they were sold or when they uh, were brought out of the country to kind of bear witness, also started on to take this kind of social life as they traveled to other places and were um, put on show in other um uh, in other contexts, sometimes just in people's homes, uh, sometimes kind of in more kind of community settings. Um, and then we also kind of started through this, doing this exhibition to look at the practice of curating as kind of a practice of caring for the kind of difficult knowledges that are contained in these uh, textile artifacts in, in their different registers. So that was kind of the start of it. But then um, I met this woman called Beatriz Arias from uh, Colombia in a workshop in Northern Ireland on, on textile language in academia, and uh, we applied for a project and we got the funding for it. And that's when we embarked on uh, a journey of using textile making as a methodology and as a specific or kind of specific textile techniques as a method in research. And the research was with ex-combatants of the guerrilla group FARC in Colombia. So the FARC signed a peace agreement in 2016, and we wanted to find out how, how how these ex-combatants, so how their subjectivity basically changes in this kind of transformation process from war to, to a, a civilian life, but also how they build relationships with uh, communities in Colombia. Um, so kind of in this project, we then used uh, specifically embroidery and sewing as unusual ways to engage these former fight fighters in research and reflection. And we also used a method on ourselves. So we were a team of, of 10 women and used uh, the same methods to kind of uh, for this kind of continuous reflexivity of our own positionality in, in the project. Um, um, and. I think both kind of in kind of in this curating as caring for so in the re reflections we got from our audience from our visitors, but also in this work um, with uh, uh, textile making as a method and a kind of a practice um, of doing research, there was something else that came in and that was this kind of embodied kind of knowledge and the embodied level of kind of understanding of what is, is going on in a research project. And there are kind of three aspects, I think, specifically to not just to making and, and uh, uh, Kim mentioned in an email to uh, us speakers that she's uh, really um, influenced also by Tim Ingold and so on, which we also read in David Gauntlet. So kind of people who have written on making, but there are people who also look more specifically into needlework as making. I think there's there's it has a lot in common with making in general, but there's also specific things to needlework. And, and one of these specific things is 
that needlework takes time. So kind of doing, doing so this is a, a kind of a, an embroidery uh, during the last kind of UCU strikes and embroidery that my colleague Gillian McFadden did to kind of say how we are a, a game of snakes and ladders in, in, in academia and so on. It takes a long time to do that. It's a slow craft that revolves around notions of mending, unraveling, recomposing materially and emotionally. And it enables kind of resignifications, but also this kind of reflecting. And then um, we did carry this out uh, individual, but also in groups. And when carried out in groups, textile making creates spaces and relations of trust and affect and mutual care, which also kind of allow, allow individuals to express their experiences and collectives um, um, kind of to establish or to resignify relations uh, between people. And then finally, textiles have this embodied effect on their makers and their audiences, and it's hard to describe in words, but it's really kind of, so we, we worked with a textile artist called Mercy Rojas, who, who says, the textile narrative is a language that can only be transmitted from and received with the body. And it's always limiting that we uh, uh, often have to, when we talk about it, we can't really trans translate that, but when you engage in the practice, then, then you understand. And I hope I have a few uh, seconds to say the final kind of point of this journey where we are at now. Uh, so together with three colleagues, and I, I think Amaya might be on this call, um, we are now thinking through what all of this means for um, kind of theorizing in international relations. And we are working on an article called Textiling International Relations, where we talk about this kind of method um, but also about two more theoretical points. And we start with kind of art historian Julia Bryan Wilson's idea of textile politics, where she says textiling means to give texture to politics, to refuse easy binaries, to acknowledge uh, complications, textures as an uneven, but also as intangibly worked and retaining some of the grain of that labor. So we, we use this to then talk about the, the, the methods, but also to think about textiling as a metaphor. So uh, uh, theorizing in IR works with metaphors, but these metaphors are often quite static around buildings and foundations and networks and, and kind of, um, so there's, there are specific uh, things that are being mentioned, but to think through, so what does it mean if we use textile methods and the kind of the kind of making, so they're obviously different textile techniques and embroidery is different from weaving, is different from knitting and so on. But what does it mean to think theory through in those ways and make it, um, and I think that we are onto something there. And kind of this last step we are taking in this, is, this is uh, very much where, where Amaya's work comes in, is that we try to think about research uh, relationally as, as a cosmopraxis where, where it doesn't make any sense anymore to, to think about kind of us as the builder of some theoretical building and then doing some methods, but where kind of methods and participants and researchers become enmeshed in, 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 in a more of a relational uh, thinking. So Amaya has used in her work on, on cosmopraxis in, in, uh, uh, in the Andes, um, the metaphor of weaving, and we're trying to think this through what it means for, for uh, theorizing in IR. But that is not yet uh, not written yet, so I, <laughs> I can't really say what the outcome of that will be, but I, we feel we have something to contribute to a, a discipline that's obsessed with states and stuff by looking at textiles. Thank you so much. I'm I'm learning a lot about uh, international relations recently and this um, the relationship with with materiality. It was great to get that overview of your of your work. Thank you so much, Berent. Um, we you're now on mute. Sorry, sorry, Kim. I'm um, sorry. <laughs> going my going my. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we'll move on to uh, Susan Forster, uh, who is a PhD candidate in the, in the School of Art and an artist as well. And um, then we'll move on to Simon Bannon. So, Susan. Hello. Hello. Um, I do have um, a PowerPoint, but it's really, I think, the written text is kind of more, um, more talks about what I want to say, if that's all right. Um, so yeah, I'm, 
I've just started only two weeks ago, so I'm very, very new to the, the PhD process. Um, so I would say I'm still very much at the point of trying to understand uh, what materiality in art actually means. Uh, so I've been looking at a book um, called Materiality in the series Documents of Contemporary Art. And I came across this phrase, um, moment, uh, which is moments when materials become willful actors and agents within artistic processes. I'll repeat that because it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, moments when materials become willful actors and agents within artistic processes. Uh, this, this phrase clearly speaks about the way that I work um, because invariably my starting point is being drawn to a material or an object and to be drawn uh, to be drawn to something suggests agency on the part of the object. So um, in my work, I'm, I'm starting without an agenda. I'm, I'm not addressing any issues. I'm not raising awareness or consciousness. I'm just making things out of stuff. So at the beginning, it's just about the, the um, aesthetics of the thing, its physical qualities. But I think really what interests me is the way ordinary materials, when transformed into an art object, can suggest not materiality itself, but its opposite, the non-material, and can invite an encounter with the beyond and the sacred. Now, I don't set out to make such a thing, but when I feel that I've achieved it, I feel um, satisfied. And I think this is important um, because I think it's, um, I think it's about existing, that the, the, the material says I exist, I exist, and it invites us all to relate to our, our, our smallness really in this vast universe and particularly to this um, planet on which we, abide. Um, so what I want to talk through is my process of making what happens in the studio where I've been pretty solitary for the past couple of years, like, like many of us. So the object grabs my attention and I think, well, I can do something with you. For example, for my um, MA final exhibition, I was working with um, models of wooden pallets uh, because there was a wooden pallet sitting in outside my studio window and I thought it was a really interesting thing. And what attracted me, it was the combination of this very crude material, quite clumsily put together, but it's a very good functional design. And somehow the whole thing adds up to um, an aesthetic economy so this object, which has um, invited me to join it, hangs about in my studio and it's a kind of flirtation at a period of, of experimentation where I'm just kind of seeing what it can do, what I can do with it. And we fall in love. And the experiments begin to have promise, but the outcome is unknowable. Actually, I don't know what I'm doing or why or what it's about. As we know, falling in love is not enough. And when the going gets tough, it involves real commitment. And there was a moment during my um, second year of the MA when I thought, oh, I do not want to see another palette. I just want to do something else. I want to paint something. I want to sew something, anything than fiddle about making models of pallets. Um, but I managed to overcome that hurdle. So I'm saying there is a relationship between me and the material. And the question is, will there be a child? And eventually a time comes when the work does become viable. It seems to 
add up to something. It's able to stand on its own two feet. And then, like a child, I'll have to let it go because it wants to exist in its own way. And there was, it's very interesting, the last three exhibitions I've done, everything's been ready. I've decided how it's all going to be set out. It's already there. Um, I'm, I'm happy with my curating, though Miranda may have other thoughts about it, usually does. And then kind of really at the last moment, suddenly this work takes over and it says, no, I don't want to be there. I want to be here. Um, take all that other stuff away. And at the last minute, many things change. And I think this is kind of telling about the kind of relationship between me as an artist and the object that I'm making and that it's not just me making it, it's, it's, it's a cooperation. Um, so that, that was really what I wanted to describe about the material process. I don't know how I'm doing for time, but if you, um, if you want to see some of the images from the, um, from the exhibition and stuff that I'm doing now, I'm very happy to share them. Do you do you mean Susan um, as a as a shared screen or yes a, shared screen yeah yeah that would be nice yeah okay um, so I won't spend long on the images because we're I'm sure we're running out of time oh no where is it desktop here we are it's gone where is it can you see the screen because I can't see it now I can see the screen but not uh, not any images. I can right. see the screen though. Um, so, where is it? Um, I can't see. I'm gonna, can I come out of this and try again? Yeah. Um, I say stop share. Where is share screen? Share. No, it's gone. E. Uh, we can always move on to yeah, sign on, and then you can, uh, if you want to work it out in the background. Okay, fine. I'll, time I'll, I'll try and do that. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. Um, yeah, if you want to just stop sharing there, Susan. Thanks. Super, thank you so much. It was actually really nice to have um, something talking about a, 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 a sort of non-intentionality -in and um, how objects call you in, in particular ways and that kind of relationship between, um, between you and, and things. Um, so our last speaker is Simon Bannum, who's Professor of Sonography in the Department of Theatre, Film and Television Studies and the head of department there, Simon. Thank you, Kim. Um, an hour, an hour and a quarter to get increasingly nervous. I knew going last was, was a mistake. I'm the, the wind up act. It's time to play Hey Ho Silver on the, on the dance floor, I think. Um, I'm going to share one image. Um, and I, I just I'll, I'll, a, bit, a bit of a preamble, really, the, um, to put to put some thoughts in your head. I always talk to my students about um, thinking through their body, thinking through their hands. Um, it's a different kind of understanding. Um, I had a response to this the other day, and I I don't know where it's from. The student couldn't remember where she read it. Um, at the moment, I don't want to know, I just want to live with the thought, um, which is that uh, if whatever you look at, you can imagine what it's like to lick. So that seemed to me um, a, a perfect place to begin in terms of thinking about materiality. Um, I, the, the, um, I situate myself, and I'm speaking not not as not as professor of sonography or or head of department, whatever, but as the designer of, uh, for a company called Quarantine that I co-founded um, over 20 years ago. 
Um, and this is this is where all the work comes from, where my thinking comes from. Um, and I, when I was um, working on the at the Prague Quadrennial in in 2015, uh, I was listening to um, the designer for the Worcester Group, Jay, um, Jim Kleber, who who's who was talking about how there could not be something that has no memories. There can't be a space, an object that has no memory. And for me, this was a, this was a, a confirmation of, of what I thought, what I was doing. And, and, but at the same time, on that occasion, that was my first introduction to the sonographer, Katrin Brack, um, whose um, wonderful, unremitting, demanding singularity of her sonography um, set us against that as a, as a as an utter temptation um, to me as a as a designer as somebody um, who who wants to to revel in and celebrate and 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 to lick materials um, extraordinary extraordinary work um, and I thought when when Kim asked me to do this I said what what do I know about materiality I know I do it how do I how do I know um, I what what context is there? So I went back and and forgive me. I, I went back to the first thing I could remember writing um, that was that was published, and to the last thing that has has been published. Just short articles. So I'm going to, I'm going to read. I'm going to take out the names of the productions. This was a something um, I wrote called Cooking with My Daughters, um, and it's a menu of ingredients. Um, Two slices of seating banks separated by red silk flowing down the centre. A small fragment of room, flowered wallpaper and upholstery served with tea as a preparation for a licorice black journey of smells and sounds from the edges of your memory. A collection of old memories and new experiences housed in private spaces wrapped in a communal corridor with soup at its heart. Two slabs of concrete perched on steel legs, sandwiching a path of underlit rice prepared in the timber-framed Tudor Hall in Leicester. Discovered in a crumbled gra garage in Ghent and served on a warm red tray containing a circular table of cherry wood and rice. 750 light bulbs on a bed of black cables with a dress of faded flowers a single green pool table on a surface of scuffed vinyl tiles sprinkled with tab ends, a parquet dance floor spread with white balloons and edged with buffet tables, buffet tables under a glaze of 150 mirror balls with a side dish of freshly prepared sandwiches and crisps. In the mold of shuttering ply under a sagging star cloth nestles an awkward litter of plastic chairs, a pink wall, little bags, a water cooler, a broken neon sign, all garnished with a fake palm tree. A squash of spectators at the breakfast bar, layered with the flicker of television screens, the slow pulse of cheap disco light and a sliver of polished dance pole to secure the whole. And then moving on, almost 20 years, uh, just to show how, how I've just been dealing with the same thing over and over again. Over the past 20 years, I've unpacked my belongings, acquired new ones, borrowed some, stolen others, and made sense of them in ways that framed and punctuated each new event and the questions provoked by that work. Objects that speak of themselves. They are a shifting and extended family invited individually or severally. Singular and multitudes of mirror balls, many red plastic bucket chairs stacked, once green, but that was a mistake. Trestle tables, American legs, please. Tin foil blankets, walls, on one occasion painted, usually natural. Constructed from variations on ply, medium density fiberboard and cardboard boxes. Forlorn festoons, trailing cables leading to speakers, to disco lights that should have been retired long, long ago, to microphones, to a field of light bulbs, always and occasionally reluctantly balloons, 
guiltily wasteful but glorious LX tape, food, sandwiches, soups, summer rolls, projection screens and projected texts, floors, red dance floor on the roll, gray dance floor, just the right warm gray green one, please. Uh, wooden parquet dance floors in one meter square panels, curtains, red silk and red velvet, slash curtains, gold or silver, plastic cold store curtains and star cloths, stuffed toys, rabbit costumes and mechanical rabbits, once, or, once unseen. Three drum kits, twice with accompanying bands, little bags. So, that's my material. That's that's what I that's that's what I use these these objects as actants and um, things which exist predominantly things which exist. It's it's drawing in the familiar um, into into a theatrical frame, and then inviting inviting people in to share it. And what to to achieve what to achieve that shared space, which um, which I believe I hope has. Um, has no hierarchy to it. We're removing ourselves as, as makers from the center of the event. We are, we're allowing the, the, uh, the objects, the sense of what it feels like to lick it, um, to become part of the, part of the, the animation of, of the space. Um, and I suppose that temptation of, of um, I still, there's still a tension between the temptation um, to succumb to Catherine Brack uh, and to fall um, into the um, uh, acknowledging that actually I am I am Worcester Group um, at heart. That there's a uh, that those objects, those repeated um, family of objects which occur again and again and again in quarantine shows, they bring their own biographies, they bring their own histories, they speak um, to a new audience, they speak to an old audience um, in, uh, in, in different ways. Um, uh, I'm sure I never managed to speak for five minutes continuously in my entire life, so um, that's probably enough for me, but I, wouldn't, I want to leave uh, you all with a question. Um, which is, what have you thought about when you've been looking at the image? Thank you, Simon. That's a, that's a, a beautiful way to end, actually, and a nice way to loop us back to that relationship between art making and, and cooking.